This is Edinburgh. And conveniently next to the railway line is Edinburgh Castle. It's changed hands a few times, with various people trying to get their grubby paws on it. But this is the story of my favourite attempt of all. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged, and the tale of a castle, an uprising, and an attempt to defy gravity in the quest for gold and glory. The castle is obviously a pretty secure stronghold. It's on top of a volcano, which, as bases go, is second only to being in a volcano. It's bordered by rock faces on three sides, and a moat on the fourth, and where Princess Street Gardens is now was once the Nor Loch, a man-made loch slash cesspit defending the north side and filled with everything people could think to chuck in it. Imagine the worst things and you're probably somewhere near close. There's been a fortification here, possibly since the Iron Age, and before that it's been speculated there were maybe settlements on the top. And you can see why. It's high up, gives you one of the best vantage points in the area, and it's easily defended. It's been used as a royal residence, a seat of government, a military garrison, and even a prison. It's actually the most besieged place in Britain, and a place a lot of people have tried to escape from, some more successfully than others. In 1811, 49 French prisoners of war hacked their way out, leaving a permanent reminder in the south wall. But today, we're more interested in breaking in. Maybe the most notable raid was on the 14th of March, 1314. Thomas Randolph, Earl of Murray, Robert the Bruce's nephew, retook the castle from the English in the dead of night. Randolph had heard about a path that went up the rock face and was used by one of his men to visit a lady. He had most of the men launch an attack on the castle from the front, but that was just a distraction. A smaller force went up the path and scaled the curtain wall unseen. Bruce ordered the castle to be destroyed in the aftermath. He was a guerrilla and didn't like castles that could fall into enemy hands. But Bruce did spare St Margaret's Chapel, and that's why it's the oldest part of the castle today. When Bruce died, Edward III invaded in 1333, supporting the claim of Edward Balliol, and the English army retook the castle in 1335. In 1341, William Douglas, Lord of Liddesdale, and some men disguised themselves as merchants with supplies. They drove a cart into the entrance to the castle, jamming the gates open, and then an army hidden behind them stormed the place, taking it back. I made a couple of videos this summer about the Jacobite uprising of 1745, but there were a few uprisings, and maybe the second most famous was the one in 1715. The Jacobites viewed James Stuart, the son of James VII, as the rightful heir to the Scottish, English and Irish thrones. James VII had been deposed by William of Orange and his own daughter, Mary, in the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and the Jacobites wanted his son, James Edward, on the throne. John Erskine, Earl of Mar, raised James's standard at Braemar and started an uprising with a slight problem. He jumped the gun. He hadn't actually been told to do it. Meanwhile, Edinburgh Castle held arms for up to 10,000 men and 100,000 pounds that had been paid to Scotland after the Union of 1707. Cash and weapons are always handy when you're trying to overthrow a government. Maybe if they could take the castle, Lowlanders would finally have the confidence to declare their support for the uprising. Step forward the unlikely figure of Dr William Arthur, the king's botanist, and his brother Thomas, who'd been an ensign in the castle. They assembled a force of somewhere between 80 and 100 men, around half of them were said to be Highlanders. The story goes that Thomas Arthur persuaded a sergeant and a couple of sentries to see things from a Jacobite point of view, no doubt greasing the wheels with some cash. 
the soldiers would keep a watch for the Jacobites coming over the wall and help them up on the north side. Lord Drummond had a ladder made wide enough to have several men climb side by side. The guards would raise it with ropes and pulleys from the top. They waited till the 8th of September. Then one of two things happened. In one version, William Arthur was a warrior. So much of a warrior that his wife couldn't fail to notice that his face was trapping him. And when he told her why, she wrote to Sir Adam Coburn and then he wrote to the deputy governor of the castle, Lieutenant Colonel Stewart, who doubled his guards. The conspirators, meanwhile, had met in a local tavern, getting themselves psyched up. Always a good sign. They were a mixed bag. Officers, writers, romantics in some cases, and stayed longer than they should have and talked louder than they should have. Eventually well oiled, they assembled here at St Cuthbert's Church. When they finally made it to the wall, the guards lowered the ropes. They attached the ladder and began pulling them up. But time in the pub had complicated things. It's thought their loud chat hadn't gone unnoticed. And just to stick a cherry on the top, their ladder was too short. And the guards were at the end of their shifts. As their replacements arrived, they panicked and dropped the rope. One of them let off a shot in the direction of the Jacobites, trying to distance himself from what was going on. That told them they'd been rumbled, and they ran. Four of them were captured, and one would eventually be executed. William Arthur escaped to Italy, where he died of dysentery in 1716. The sergeant who'd fired the shot, William Ainsley, would be hanged from the castle wall on the 7th of January 1717, before a strong wind snapped the rope, and he was found at the foot of the rock days later. The uprising eventually failed and no one would ever come that close to taking the castle again. The last military action it would see would be when Charles Edward Stuart blockaded it in 1745, but abandoned that after the governor of the castle began firing on the city. These days it is still partly used for military purposes, but mainly it's a national monument, and for the tourists. This is the most visited tourist attraction in Scotland, with 2.2 million visitors a year. And sometimes, it's still difficult to get in.